Kyle Kingsbury, welcome to the show. Hell yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Woo. We're honored, man. So for the listeners who aren't familiar, you're the director of human optimization at Onnit. Give us a little bit of your backstory growing up in California, playing football at ASU, fighting in the UFC, and kind of how you got here. Yeah, um, you know, I, I really had, uh, Ryan, my man, uh, I really had, sorry guys, I really had uh, a lifelong pursuit in athletics. I started playing football when I was 10. Um, yeah, I kind of got mad at my dad in hindsight because he had wrestled and done a lot of different uh, martial arts growing up and he never really pushed me to do any of that stuff. And I was like, what the hell, man? You were wrestling from a younger age than I was. Why didn't you get me into that? And he's like, I was, I never wanted to push you into anything. But if you said yes to it, then you're, I, would, I would help you out with that. It's probably part of the reason you're very tall. You didn't stunt your growth. 6'4", <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? You didn't have me banging it. Almost, yeah. You didn't have me doing back squats at a young age. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I, got in a, I started with Pop Warner football. And, you know, back then there was a big emphasis on hitting, which I really loved. You know, like they say, put your face mask on them. You know, that kind of shit. Now they don't even, not even allowed to hit with your, with your face mask or any part of your helmet. But um, grew up doing that. Played football at Arizona State. When I got done with football, I was pretty depressed. Didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And then started training in mixed martial arts because that, to me, was going to bridge the gap for some sort of camaraderie and human interaction. And I didn't think I would fight professionally, but everything kind of kind of took off. And in about six months into my training, a uh, local guy who owned the gym I was training at also owned a small promotion in Arizona called Rage in the Cage. And he's like, dude... You're big, you're handsome, you can fight heavyweight, why don't you come fight for me and just get your feet wet if you like it and you do well, you can keep going. If not, you can at least say, I was a fuck, I had a pro fight as a cage fighter. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. And my first two fights, one in under 30 seconds and was completely hooked. Knockout really, or? Uh, TKO, knees to the gut. Ooh. So I had an affinity <laughs> for, for Muay Thai. I just grabbed dudes by the head in what they call the plum position and bury a knee. And I was fairly athletic, especially... You know, in the lower levels when you're fighting heavyweight, and the game's changed now. I mean, every every level's improved now. But back then, you'd have a lot of, like, barroom brawlers and dudes mm-hmm. that weren't necessarily athletic but just loved to scrap. The Tank Abbott types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Tank's even a better athlete than some of the guys I was going against. You know, like, we had just guys <laughs> that were, like, big dudes who wanted to fight and really had no athletic background. So, it you know, my, my skill set coming from football and fresh out of football, out of Division One football, it was there was a clear cut difference there. But you know, going through the fight career, it really uh, instilled a passion for me to learn more about biohacking and anything that had to do with performance. Hmm. And then of course as I transitioned away from fighting, uh, that thirst for knowledge continued because I have now had to heal my brain. I had to heal a lot of TBI. Uh, I've had my left eye fractured twice, my jaw broken in two places. I mean I've if someone's hitting me in the face hard enough to break bones, it's likely taking its toll on my brain. And TBI, traumatic brain injury. Yeah. For the people. Yeah. yeah. All right. Nice. For, for the for the for the lay folk that don't know what TBI is, <laughs> we've been taking a lot of CTE. shots to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, Just tell me what CTE is. CTE. Uh, that one's cra- harder cra- to say. Cranial trauma. No, I don't know. it's it's like cento cent. You gotta pull that up for me, Ryan. <laughs> cento encephalopathy, something weird like that. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never say that one. That's yeah. Just the acronym CTE. Watch that Will Smith movie. Mm-hmm. Um, anywho, though, you know, started <laughs> started really yeah started really paying attention to that. Oh, here we go. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Mm. Pathy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that really gave me, um, you know, when I when I quit fighting four years ago in 2014, I really wanted to continue to learn more. I didn't know, um, I still didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up, but I knew what I was passionate about and um, just continue to learn those things. And, you know, I went on the Rogan podcast. He was like, start a podcast. You got a lot to talk about. So I did that. And then I went out to Paleo FX two years ago met Aubrey Marcus, we shared the same flight home, traded war stories about plant medicines and diet, fasting, nutrition, everything in between, fighting in the UFC, um, running a 55K ultra, trying to deadlift 600 pounds. I mean, every everything that I was into, and he's like, dude, I want you to come work it on it. And he created this position for me, uh, Director of Human Optimization, because their, their company tagline is total human optimization. So they're all about everything that I'm into. And, um, 
you know, a lot of people in this field, like yourself, you're an entrepreneur, Ben Greenfield as well, and he's a close friend of, mm-hmm. of Aubrey and mine and, and the company. Um, but they got their own thing, you know, and I was kind of like a free agent that was just starting off in the world. And he had asked me, you know, like, what do you have outside the podcast? And I was like, there's something to do outside of podcasting. And he's <laughs> like, oh, yeah. He's like, that's just one. That's one piece, man. That's only one piece. And Aubrey really saw more in me than I saw in myself at the time and showed me, you know, there's a lot more we can do together. And so when I came out here for an interview, uh, it was like two weeks later, we had all our stuff moving out and on a truck and we had moved out to Austin. Very cool, man. Wow. That was two years ago? Yep. So you've two been years here ago. two years. And I, I mean, Aubrey, I, you know, we'll both be here on podcasts, talk about each other that we're, we're best friends. And it's a funny thing to say about your boss, but it's also funny for people like, you guys know each other for two years. Like, well, as you guys know, uh-huh. uh, when you do some pretty serious plant medicine work, there's, <laughs> you go, it's like going to war. I mean, it's, and I haven't been to war, so I don't want to trivialize that, but mm-hmm. uh, you go through something incredibly challenging and yep. difficult and it's incredibly bonding. And I think that's certainly been, um, you know, one of the ways that we've come closer together through those experiences and also through challenging experiences like Burning Man, because you know, Burning Man's a fun party and it's adult playground, but you got to deal with the elements. It's scorching hot during the day. There's dust storms. It's freezing cold at night. So you get to see people under pressure and where they crack. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a pretty cool thing to hang because you have, you know, out of 20 people, there's some people cracking around you. There's some people who can't really handle it. And then, you know, I'm looking at Aubrey and, and he always calls me, you know, the mountain, not from Game of Thrones, but just that mountain medicine of somebody who's like a standing rock that can really hold hold space and mm-hmm. be unwavering. And I've always appreciated that, you know, because I don't always see that in myself. But again, you know, he sees that in me. So it's it's been a it's been an amazing time coming here and I've learned a lot in doing it, but also, you know, built some really cool relationships along the way. That's awesome, man. Yeah. What of of the plant medicines that you've used what has had the most profound impact on your life? It's hard to decipher between the top two. Uh, the top two would be penis envy mushrooms, which are at least two to three times stronger than any mushroom known you, to man. You put me on those, and I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, buddy. They're, they're a league of their own, right? I yeah. Mean, to say they're, they're, they're at least three times stronger than the most common mushrooms, like... Uh, Golden Teacher or B plus, like something you'd find at a festival that are organically grown in a field on cow poop, mm-hmm. harvested in the Pacific Northwest and a lot of places in Florida. That's that's what they're hand picking and and getting at a festival. So that's about three times stronger than that. Twice as strong as really good Mexican Oaxacan mushrooms. But you can't just say that, right? Because they do have their own kind of energy, and I think they are in a league of their own. But um, they almost feel like a different medicine than a lot of the other mushrooms I'd tried in the past. No question. And it's not just scalable. That's what I mean by it's hard to say that it's two or three times stronger because I've had close to 15 grams of regular mushrooms before. At one time? Yeah. And five grams of penis envy was just, it's not even fucking close. I mean, the five grams of penis envy was like, oh, wow. Like I have to rely on everything to get me through this right now. Breath work, (laughs) mindset, uh, surrender, complete surrender. I'm not in control. Just let go. Whatever I see, I see. Do not fight anything. And then those experiences can be some of the most beautiful and transformative I've ever had. Similar to ayahuasca. And I think Mm. in a lot of ways, ayahuasca prepared me to be able to work with penis envy. Um, But, you know, I, I would put ayahuasca right up there with mushrooms because... They're, they're a different energy and it sounds really weird to people and woo woo to say like ayahuasca has a feminine energy in this grandmother medicine, mm-hmm. but there is that feel to it. And, um, you know, getting, getting a little bit out there too, you know, this idea that everything is conscious. They talk about that in the book of sapiens. Um, animism is a form of one of the first religions. And a lot of native Americans believe this, that everything is animated. Everything is conscious. Everything has soul. Uh, from mountains to the earth to the moon to the sun to us as individuals to all the plants and so um, the idea is for thousands of years this has been handed down as a technology from one generation to the Mm -hmm. next through apprenticeship and what they have learned and understood you know speaking specifically about the Shipibo in Peru with ayahuasca is that there are very specific ways you can work with this medicine and that's why it can be really uh, troubling for people you know, if it's not done proper and you're not held in a really safe container. But, um, you know, if you 
have had. You guys are going to go to Rhythmia soon. And Next yeah. month, have, yeah. yeah first play, timers. We're going, we're, we're going to Soltara uh, at the end of May, and really excited for that. That'll be our first time there. That's also in Costa Rica. And oh, nice. Dennis McKenna is on the board of that place. Oh, I've okay. heard great, That's great Terrence things. That's Terrence McKenna's about, son. Yeah, uh, brother. Brother. Okay. So I've heard great things about both those places. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, I got to go with Aubrey to Spirit Quest. There's great reviews there. That's an amazing place with Don Howard, and so. You know, if it's been vetted by other people that you trust, there's a higher likelihood of you coming out of that experience, you know, better than positive, you know, more whole yeah. than when you left. And um, I think that's really important, too, when you talk about things like ayahuasca to mention that. What would you say to someone who's on the fence about plant medicine in general? And and like because I was, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and now we're approaching, let's say, 30 days out from our first ayahuasca experience at Rhythmia. What would you say to someone who's on the fence, A, about ayahuasca and plant medicine, and then B, about successively embarking on that experience and how to do it in the best way? Yeah, so I mean, there are there are books to read, and I think that's a really good way to bridge the gap mm -hmm. is, you know, people have put years into these books that they mm -hmm. write. So like Michael Pollan has a great book, uh, How to Change Your Mind. I think that really covers a lot of the bases when it comes to psychedelics, and he's speaking from, you know, he's an author who's involved mainly with food. And now, you know, he changed his life through plant medicine, psychedelics, drugs, whatever you want to call it. But he was very the specific uh, drugs. eat real food, not too much, mostly plants guy. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's a great writer and a great speaker. And uh, it's cool to have that guy kind of on the front lines, bridging the gap for mm -hmm. people who are who know him from a different avenue, as opposed to, you know, a Timothy Leary who's tune in, drop out, you know, that kind of uh, that kind of mindset where it's like so in your face beating the drum it's it's no different than if you hear somebody beating the vegan drum or beating the carnivore drum it's like whoa whoa whoa, whoa you know like come mm -hmm. on so i think having having that kind of approach from from who you're learning from from can really help i read a book called um the cosmic serpent uh, by jeremy narby and that goes really into ayahuasca itself and talks a lot mm -hmm. about what what can happen in that experience from shared visions which is bananas to think that like telepathically you and I could have the same exact vision if we're in the room together at the same exact time. Wow. I've heard and a lot of cases of that. Yeah. And we wouldn't know. Wow. It. And that's happened with my wife and I in ayahuasca. It's also happened in mushrooms, hmm. but you come out of that experience and you have, you know, something like closing circle where people are going to share some of the more profound moments in the experience. And my wife was talking about this vision she had of me holding a baby and she was holding the two of us. And I was like, Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> this was before I, your son, right? Yeah, I was like, I don't need to cut you off, but I had the exact same vision. And a month later, we were doing ayahuasca again, and we saw the same vision, both of us at the same time, but it was a boy now. And all my fears of becoming a dad came up, and it was like, fuck, man. And then that kind of moved away from me, and we were pregnant with Bear a month later. So that wow. was prior to us being married. You know, like we were living together and in a pretty serious relationship, yeah. but it was always you know, we'll do that down the road kind mm -hmm. of thing. You know, it was never like, it wasn't greenlit mm -hmm. in that yeah. ayahuasca kind of greenlit that for us. But yeah, the fact that you can share visions like that and there's just so much more to it, but it really opened my mind to what was possible. And, you know, it doesn't matter what you fucking read or who you talk to, it will never encapsulate the experience. And that's something Terrence McKenna always talked about, whether it was DMT or the heroic dose of mushrooms or any experience is that, you know, he'd say language, language <laughs> can't, can't encapsulate the experience. And it can't, like it mm -hmm. cannot, you, we don't have the fucking words to really break down what that experience is. But what's cool about it is that it is, it is direct contact with whatever higher intelligence there is, you know, and I think that has opened me up to so much more in the way that I view the world from a consciousness standpoint to what happens when I die to the a very common lesson in ayahuasca of I'm not my body and whatever I am will continue on at long after my body is gone. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty cool to have that mm -hmm. visceral knowing um, whether it's true or not. I'd rather live that way than think like YOLO, I'm fucked when it all ends. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. going to go dark. I'd much rather believe that. So um, maybe that's it too. But I, it definitely feels to a lot of people, including myself, like the information coming in, it's not just a chemical reaction happening in my brain because it's stranger than any dr wildest dream I've ever had. You know, it's, it's so far out there and it's so personal um, when it comes to unpacking trauma 
and seeing the future in a way and, and like I'd say 90% of the things that I've seen that haven't happened yet have all come to fruition. So whether that was mushrooms or, you know, like ayahuasca, us having a son and it's like, bam, we're there, you know. And of course, that took us pulling the goalie. So it's not like it was like some type of fucking <laughs> pulling the goalie. Immaculate immaculate conception. Conception. Yeah. That's hilarious. But I mean, but, you know, we obviously had our hand in it. But I'm just saying that, that um, you know, a lot of these things uh, do pan out. So I think that's also pretty fascinating, too. Do you feel like there's a... a a law of attraction component where it almost like amplifies the power of your visualization and your ability to manifest what you're seeing when you're in that plant medicine experience. I think so. And I think, and you know, what you were talking about there in the end of that, you know, people, when people hear the law of attraction, they think of the secret, yeah. which is a double edged sword because mm -hmm. that becomes the, like the wishing well, like, yep. Oh, yeah. all you have to do is believe it'll happen. Sitting on your no, couch no, you with your fingers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bro, bust your ass. Yeah. We're going to get thing, skinny. You know? I'm yeah. going to get skinny. Yeah. <laughs> no. You gotta get your maybe ass if up. you if you, all you did was chant, I'm gonna get skinny, and you actually stopped eating, yeah, and you fasted, yeah, maybe, for 40 maybe, days, 40 nights, then you're good, but um, but yeah, you know, everything takes a little effort, but I do feel like uh, in the grand scheme of things, and this sounds, it's it, it's funny for to hear myself talking about this because it does sound religious, and I'm I'm not that. I do consider myself highly spiritual. And highly, just in case, or spiritual AF, as my boy JP says. <laughs> You're woke. JP Sears says, we're, right? We're hanging out um, with JP tomorrow. Yeah, yeah we're hanging out with JP. He's yeah. hilarious. He's awesome. So, but like that, that concept that we're in a concert and it's so much bigger than we can possibly fathom with our human brain. And to know that, that and it's not, you know, well, God has a plan. Like that, that never resonated with me. But to also mm -hmm. know that there are things happening that are far beyond my wildest imagination. And this is there's so much working in in our favor that's behind the scenes that we can't see mm -hmm. you know you think about and i use the analogy like you can't see a microwave you can't see the full spectrum of light we can't, can't see emfs yeah we can't <laughs> hear the full spectrum of sound we can't see cell phone signals emfs right like but mm -hmm. we know they fucking work you yeah. can't hear a dog whistle yeah so like if my cell phone <laughs> communicate with yours through a towel like or through a tower like i can the, the possibility of us being able to communicate f through our brains through this antenna that we have like maybe that is possible maybe mm -hmm. we've just been we've been cultured out of those experiences right or just so, so much noise added to our experience that we can't pick up on the subtleties yeah mm -hmm. yeah because we're bombarded yeah. you know in in, uh, in our current society so yeah. what's cool is that it's it's been a a refresher in my imagination and it's brought me back to the magic of reality like there is so much more and I and then that in knowing that to realize I don't need to figure it all out mm -hmm. because right now we're in the information age we have Google at our fingertips and it's like fuck let me digest more let me know yeah. more let me that's all information wide. overload like, yeah and it's like no 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 that's that's not that's not actually wisdom wisdom is when you learn something and you put it into practice and you mm -hmm. embody that knowledge the embodiment of knowledge becomes wisdom and that happens through experience and that's I think what sets plant medicines apart from so many other things you know they say it's like psychic surgery you can go through 10 years of psychotherapy in a single night in eight hours and if it's done properly you'll be able to process that and come out a better person yeah that's been a lot of the benefits that i've experienced too is taking things that i intellectually knew and believed in my heart but had never felt like that we are a you know, a spiritual being having a human experience and that this, this body, this soul suit is temporary, but we will go on forever. And like, I believed all of that, but during some of these experiences, I felt it. And it was like, that's the truth. And I can, I can embody that now. Yeah. And like and in, it, in a way that I hadn't been able to before. And it comes in so many different ways. Like, I mean, I've been shown that multiple ways in ayahuasca. I've been shown that multiple ways in mushrooms, for example. Um, I asked like, is, will I live on after this, after I die? And what it showed me, the first vision, I, one of the first visions I had in ayahuasca was, I watched my body die and decompose and mushrooms grew out of it. <laughs> and you know, like all the birds had come to pick it, pick at it before, you know, vultures, things like that before, yeah. cause I was just on top of the ground. I wasn't buried six feet in the ground. And, um, and it was just a recycling process. But what it showed me was even on this plane, the plane we live in, and in Taoism, they call it the world of 10,000 things, right? Mm. Like even here, it's infinite. Even here, it just changes. So yeah, my body won't be the same. It's going to become something else. Just like when I eat 
you know, the boar that I shot in Hawaii, like it's no longer the boar, it becomes me and it becomes everyone else I feed with it. And the, the remains of that animal were eaten by other pigs, mm. which is a weird thing to say, but I mean, everything is recycled. Every single thing is recycled here. So it was showing me the infinite nature of the plane we live in here. And then of course, many different ways that it showed me the infinite nature of what happens afterwards. And, and it just, it just keeps going, you know, and that's what's cool. I think science is catching up to this. Mm -hmm. And we see that now with a lot, with what's happening in, in uh, the metaphysical field and, and the research going on there. But, you know, like if the universe is expanding in all directions at all times right now, and there's, and there's no sign of it slowing down. So at any point in the universe, if I was on, whether I'm on Earth or whether I'm in the Andromeda galaxy, it looks like everything is moving away from me at the same speed. <laughs> That's fuck. Like, how do you wrap your head around that? Yeah. At any point in the universe, everything is moving away from you at the same speed. Like, it's expanding in all directions. And that, I mean, like, when you start to think about that, it's like, that's a hard concept to grasp until psychedelics. Then you're like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I fucking get it. Like, yeah, that, that, it gives you a glimpse of whatever our monkey mind can, can wrap around that idea of infinity. For sure. When we were here about six months ago, you were talking about, uh, you and your wife Natasha exploring an open marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you knew we'd get there. You knew we'd get there. <laughs> what has that been like for the past six months or so? Man, I find it fascinating. It though. has been the most challenging thing I've done. So when you think of like any hard ceremony, like or you know, challenging like ayahuasca or boga, they all have an end point. You know, you, it's not like the, the idea of perma frying is, is bullshit. You know, like maybe if you take too much acid back in the 60s, that could happen. But, you know, the ayahuasca ceremony ends at a certain point. So however challenging it is, you get to come out of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Open relationship is the ceremony that doesn't end. And it requires every tool that I know to reset myself, to drop from the monkey mind back into my heart space, to feel more, to listen more, to communicate better. And much of the way fighting lit a fire under my ass to learn more about health and wellness and recovery and longevity, open relationship lit a fire in my ass to speak better. You know, like the, uh, this book, Nonviolent Communication, I think is one of the best books I've ever read. Really? Highly recommend it to people, whether you're open or monogamous. We'll conscious, put that in the show notes. Conscious sure. Loving, yeah. another great book, Catherine okay. and Gay Hendricks, um, old couple that wrote it. It's just fucking amazing. And then a book called More Than Two, An Ethical Guide to Polyamory. I read all three of those books in a two-week span because it was like, I need to know this shit mm -hmm. and I need to know it now just to navigate the waters. But I mean, I, would, I walk barefoot, you know, we ground, that kind of good stuff. And, and it's about a one-mile loop around on it. I usually listen to Audible or sometimes I'll do a walking meditation. But I was walking like eight to ten miles a day <laughs> just to calm my shit when this first started. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, fuck, man, my back's against the wall. I got to rely on all the tools. Qigong, Tai Chi, yeah. breath work, anything to reset my state of being mm. and shift from panic to calm. Yeah. And communication at a much deeper level and really sorting through. One of the cool things about nonviolent communication is that, A, it teaches you a template of how to communicate well with others so you're, you're understood. But B, it shows you how to interact with people who don't know nonviolent communication. So somebody can be speaking to you that's triggered with blame and with judgment and you can decipher what they're saying and say it back to them in a way where they feel heard and that's all anybody ever wants to feel is to feel heard yep so if they feel heard that can kind of take down the walls and start to calm the people you're talking that i'm saying this to everyone because it's really important especially if you're in a monogamous relationship and you want that to continue well communication is the fucking foundation of everything right any relationship whether it's your friend your mom your boss whatever and so um that really was something that that kind of allowed us to to make strides much quicker than than other people we've known that have been doing this longer and you know everyone around us that we talked to about this and we've learned a lot from aubrey marcus and whitney mm -hmm. we've learned a lot from dr dan Engel, people who have been involved in this for a very long time and all of them are impressed with how fast we've come along in this and we're in a really fucking great spot now you know and what's funny is i don't even have a girlfriend i'm i'm single i mean i'm married obviously <laughs> but, but uh 
I got a, I got a spot on my roster that's opened up. And Let it be known, doesn't... ladies. Let it be known. <laughs> that's right. Coming to Florida. Now accept an uh, application. My, my, my wife's boyfriend has become a very close friend of mine, you know, and he's a great guy. He's over all the time. Our son loves him. That's another element to this is that we have, we, we have a kid and we're working on number two. Um, not a lot of people in this space have children. So that was kind of like we got to carve our own path here. But really through the communication of what we want to build, we want to build tribe. You know, we read Sex at Dawn. We've had this conversation for years prior to going open. And I'm happy that we've had seven years of monogamy mm -hmm. to build trust and to build a foundation that we can lean on when there's uncertainty. You know, because it takes more trust. It takes more belief and it takes more faith that it does all work out. And to know ultimately we have each other's backs. But every fear came up you know people say yeah what about the sex what if the guy's better than you or what if he's bigger or what if i don't what doubt if they, he's bigger but what if they fall in love well, <laughs> bigger downstairs oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> figure where it matters carrie come on <laughs> um, but yeah you know i mean all those things every fear comes up and it's really through communication and trust that you can kind of break those fears down and realize that there's zero point in living in fear. Like even if even if Natasha wanted to leave me for someone else, that could happen in a fucking monogamous marriage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like me trying to be controlling and say like, no, you can't do this. You're yeah. mine and only mine. You're with mine. me. Yeah. Like that doesn't seem right either to me. And it's you know, I think I was ta I forget I was talking to you yesterday at Paleo FX about this, but again, to not have a dogmatic approach to this and be like beat the drum and say everyone should do this or this is what we'll do the rest of our lives. Like no, we are currently polyamorous. And that means more than one love. So we are working on relationships with other people where love is a part of the mix. It's not just a fuck buddy or a piece of ass on the side. We're not swingers. We're trying to build actual relationships where we have a deeper connection with those people. And our partners are connected to our other partners. So I want Natasha to be close friends with whatever girlfriend I have, just as I'm really close friends with her boyfriend. And equally important to all of that, is they got to be great with kids, you know? Yeah. And, and that's something that uh, Christian's his name. It's something Christian, it really is. He's great with kids. And Bear, our son, absolutely loves him. He says, I love you, Uncle Christian. And he's three. Oh. If he didn't love him, he'd be like, fuck you. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he's not going to say I love yeah, him. He's no. going to be like, nah. He won't, he won't want to He won't want to be around that person. But, you know, yesterday my wife got to come out to the speaker's dinner at Paleo FX and Christian was babysitting our son. And there's no issues there because I know Bear's having a great time with them every time they get to hang out. And so when I think of that, you know, we read Sex at Dawn and getting back to that book by Chris Ryan, it made sense to us, but we no longer live in tribes. We live in a world that's completely different. Um, you know, if you had 100 to 150 people in your tribe, you knew everyone very well. Everyone raised the kids communally. It didn't matter if that was, you know, like, it didn't matter. Like they're all your kids. You know what I'm saying? Like if I yeah. die, you have like 10 other dads that treat that like it's their kid. So how do we recreate something like that in the modern world? And I think it can be done through that layer of intimacy where it's, it's more than just the sex. And I think that's, that's really what we're cultivating right now. So it's pretty cool to see how fast that's come along. Uh, Cause you know, everybody I've talked to in that space that <laughs> usually doesn't operate that well that quick so i don't want to paint it as a panacea because it's for sure the hardest thing either one of us have ever done and there's still things that trigger us from time to time mm -hmm. but really having that that good base layer found foundation of communication has been the difference maker in my opinion what are some of the ground rules that you and natasha have yeah so one of them is um you know and this is a hard thing to see right out of the gate but they have to be good with kids as i mentioned um also, uh, you know, they have to make an effort to be friends with our, our my significant other, you know, and vice mm -hmm. versa. Um, when that starts to fail, that becomes a huge issue because then you're wondering about jealousies and is somebody trying to climb the ladder and, and you know, all those things become a bigger factor yeah. if their relationship breaks down. Um, I would say one of the main ground rules we have is we can have group sex, but it has to be with one another, okay. you know, so like... I think that's more my fear of her, you know, getting with the football team. Yeah. <laughs> Bukaki. <laughs> yep, Bukaki. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I'm in the mix, it's no big deal. Even if it's all dudes, it's no big deal if I'm in the mix. But I think um, 
you know, having, uh, you know, having that rule is it's, it's nice. And then, you know, that takes a lot of fear off her end too, because there are opportunities for me, especially being around Aubrey and different people who are, who are good looking, prominent, and really out there on social media about their open relationship. Um, you know, I think Ab has more opportunities than I do. You know, we talk about this on podcasts and I'm totally happy to because 90% <laughs> of the people listening to this right now, whether they want to try it or not, they can, they at least can listen and be like, you know what? I love what he said about psychedelics, but I'm not into that open relationship stuff. <laughs> but because they're listening to a podcast that's 30 minutes to an hour, they're less likely to go on and I'm <laughs> saying this like, please don't. Uh, they're more, less likely to go online and be like, you fucking cuck. Fuck you. Your kids are going to grow up shitty. You know, whatever, right? But Don't you, like. Yeah. When you, <laughs> when, you post no. on, when you post it on social media, it's a whole different ballgame. Oh, yeah. You know, the I mean, trolls. I, I posted about trans direct cranial stem out there before the Halo system came out. And that was through on its account. And they got like 350, 400,000 followers on Instagram. And like 50 comments where you're a fucking tool. I'm never buying an Onnit product again. And I was like, oh, what? Oh. We're not even selling this. There's 100 years of research that fucking backs this up. Uh, in 2014, NPR did a podcast on it, 9 Volt Nirvana. Look People it up. Are weird. It's 10 minutes long, right? Mm. So, you know, seeing Aubrey, thankfully, <laughs> yeah. he is on the front lines and, you know, he does post quite a bit about this. But seeing how many people come out of the woodwork to talk shit to him and Whitney, it's like, I don't want to invite yeah. that for us. So we, you know, we post photos and I mean, if you if you listen to us on podcasts, you can kind of figure out who's in the mix and that's fine. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to hide it. That's why I'll say Christian by name. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, it's not something we want to advertise on the gram because that just invites a whole different layer of, of shit talking. Do you, sure. do you have a limit of partners? Is there like a number that you can't cross or? So the only thing in polyamorous, something to talk about in more than two is the only limiting factor truly and whether you have kids or not is time hmm. that's it and so the the setup i guess would be primary secondary and they some people don't like to use the word secondary but uh primary partner would be your your husband or your wife or somebody that you're in a committed long-term relationship and then whoever else comes along they can be around for indefinitely but they're not the primary um i think you know, there's there's different setups where people don't have a hierarchy, and I think that's fine if children aren't involved. But with kids, like, yeah, man, mom and dad, they got to be mom and dad, mm -hmm. and your children need to be around mom and dad. So time really comes down to how how many days out of the week can we really be gone from our kids? Probably one, probably mm -hmm. only one day a week, and that doesn't mean we can't, you know, spend two nights with our significant others if and when I have a girlfriend and she has a boyfriend at the same time, I could spend one night at the girl's house he, while he's sleeping over at our house and then vice versa, right? So we can have two nights with our other partners for the variety and the novelty and the connection and still only be away from Bear for one night a week, you know? And as long as they're great with kids, our, our others, then, mm -hmm. then Bear's not missing out on anything because mm -hmm. he's getting variety of aunties and uncles, which is really how we grew up in tribes, you know, like you had yep. a tribe of elders, other people to learn from and different points of view. And sure, there needs to be alignment. It can't be, you know, auntie lets me eat shitty cupcakes every fucking day or whatever, fill in the blank. Like, no, we gotta be in alignment on some of this stuff, especially when it comes to diet and TV and all that jazz. But um, I think as long as we're in alignment and in agreement on, on a lot of things, then, you know, that variety of how people parent, how people talk to the kids, how people play, that's all welcomed. You've done, you're approaching 90 episodes of the Human Optimi Optimization Hour and surrounded yourself with some of the top performers in the world. What are your top three favorite biohacks for energy, performance? Yeah, I would say, let's see here. It's, it's, it's funny because the, bio, the biohacks are really just ancestral shit. That yeah, we forgot. yeah. Uh, Temperature change, so so temperature extremes like hot sauna, infrared sauna, um, and cold tub. Hmm. And I think the cold tub's way better than cryo. But if you only have access to cryo, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna do something. It's better than nothing. Um, I think those, as far as inflammation, detoxing the body, and ramping up mitochondria efficiency, and as you guys know, like nine times out of ten, shit comes back to the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So any ways that we can influence that, I think, are really powerful. Um, from a dietary 
standpoint, fasting, intermittent fasting, and the ketogenic diet at least a few months a year are all really important to have metabolic flexibility and kind of reset because we're bombarded with carbs. We have shipping containers that bring fucking berries from Mexico and bananas from Panama year round. And that's not always been the case. Like if you have ancestors from the equator, you might do better with small prey like fish and fowl, probably not much big game and more carbohydrates throughout the year because you had that available year round. But if you're an American who has Northern European ancestry like I do, Mm -hmm. odds are you ate bigger game like cattle, bison, that kind of stuff. You do well with red meat and you only had carbohydrates available for maybe six months out of the year, maybe nine tops, you know, some of the fall vegetables are a little higher in those starches, the tubers, those kind of things. But um, for sure in the winter time, you didn't have that, right? So at least getting that that small break, I think can be really beneficial. Um, and then, the, I mean, the last biohack, it probably would be plant medicines because that's the ultimate <laughs> consciousness yeah. hack, right? Mm-hmm. And even if you're not willing to go down the rabbit hole and take the red pill like in the matrix and see you know exactly what, what's happening behind the curtains microdosing can be incredibly beneficial and there's a great book by dr jim fadiman called the psychedelic explorer's guide and he's researched i mean this guy he was a harvard undergrad with timothy leary and richard alpert who would later become ram Dass. those were his professors at harvard in hmm. psychology and they got kicked out of school as teachers because they were beating psychedelic drum and uh you know Richard Alpert went to India. He came back as Baba Ramdas, and the rest is history with him. Um, Stanislav Grov invented holotropic breathwork. Like this dude's lineage is it's top tier when it comes to psychedelics. He did his post grad work at Stanford. Highly intelligent guy, and he's studied microdosing for the past 30, 40 years. So his book is really cool because a lot of it's anecdotal, but at the same time, it does give you a very good glimpse into what's possible with microdosing, and. Um, a lot of it has to do with LSD, which I think is is much easier uh, to microdose with than psilocybin because you know what you're getting mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to that. So, I mean, I think that's that's a great place for people to start if they're looking to get their feet wet, but they don't want to take the deep dive quite yet, and they're a little you know apprehensive about what that looks like. For sure, and we know you've got you've got some other podcasts coming up, so we're going to start bringing this thing home. Um, I I got something yeah. that I really admire about you, Kyle, and. Yes, you're a mountain of a man, and yes, you can be often seen wearing speedos and and uh, tutus or whatever the fuck you want, <laughs> because you exude self confidence and you dropped your ego like at the door. I feel like for the men and wis- women listening out there, maybe you can shed some light on how they can embody that self confidence. And you know, let's face it, a lot of people are depressed, a lot of people are sad, but you're always smiling. I mean, at least from what I've seen. And you're self-confident. Maybe yeah. you can shed some light on that. I think the, the confidence comes from putting myself in humbling situations. So competing in jiu-jitsu after fighting as a black belt, and I'm really not that good at jiu-jitsu. I'm good for a fighter, but I'm not great in pure jiu-jitsu. And losing in front of a group of people right here at On It. That's mm-hmm. a very humbling experience. Yeah. <laughs> Getting my ass kicked in Santa, the Shark Tank at San Jose in front of 20,000 local friends and family, you know, like, and on, on pay-per-view, that's very humbling. So I don't, you know, you don't have to go and fight in the UFC to have that kind of humbling experience, but you know, the cold tub can be humbling, Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. It's a great teacher. And uh, you know, fighting through that and finding stillness in something that is tough, that leads, that bleeds into all areas of life. You know, the ability to, to sustain resilience and stay calm in the storm. And I think so many of us, um, we want that 72 degrees everywhere we go. We want the super easy life. And I think if we can lean into the acute stressor and know its benefits and, and know when it's applicable, it has a tremendous impact on our mindset, how we feel and how we operate in the world. Um, ayahuasca also incredibly humbling. You yeah. know, like if you're, I've, I've been walked to the restroom multiple times through ceremonies with two women on my arms helping me get to the restroom so I can shit my brains out (laughs) after puking my brains out. Uh, You know, like we did Vilca last last summer in Peru and I pissed the bed while puking violently. I couldn't feel my body. I was out of my body. I could only feel the purge coming up. 
that's how deep I was. And Sounds so, like, intense. A lot of people are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are like, I don't want to do shit. Can't yeah. wait. Uh, <laughs> should we reschedule? Well, that's <laughs> but, you know, like, that's, that's a humbling experience. And all you can do is laugh, right? I think that was the last ceremony I did with Aubrey was uh, penis semi mushrooms. And it was so hilarious and absurd how much we laughed. We, none, none, nobody had ever laughed that hard in their life. But it was such a visceral reminder that everything we do here is fucking silly. Yeah. You know, like it's such a comical life that we're in. We don't need to take it that serious. People take life so seriously, it's, right? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, man, you got to pay the bill. Yeah. You got to pay your bills. You got to pay tax. You got to do all this stuff. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, why stress about any of it? You know, the longer I live in fear, that's just wasted fucking time that I don't get back where I was anxious and my neurochemistry was fucked up and it's a choice to be there yeah you know or i can choose to live in love and that will oftentimes take creating a state change through breath work or meditation or any of these other practices but if i can choose that and do the little steps that get me there that i know will get me there then my life is so much better along the way whether i'm you know, barely scraping by living check to check or living in my mom's garage as I did when I fought in the UFC, yeah. I can get the most out of life in any of those situations because I can find, it's easier to find gratitude and find peace when I'm actively working towards those things. Yeah, and ultimately happiness is a choice. It comes from within, not external materialistic not items. No, Yeah. so we all can choose to be happy every day. Beautiful, all right, some, some Quick fire questions. Rapid fire, hit them. What's what's your diet like right now? You're ripped year round. Oh, thank you. Well, I just went, I just went back into ketosis. Um, so we're we're uh, it's probably been I'd say nine months to a year. So I went a little bit longer stretch. Normally I do the winter months, but um, a good buddy of mine told me about this breath meter that just came out called Keto K E Y T O. And uh, it links right to your phone. They've gamified it. So it Bluetooths to the phone, but it, the Bluetooth is only on for the seconds that the, that the device is on. So it's not like buzzing in my fanny pack all day long. Um, <laughs> but it measures acetone in the breath. And one of the things I used to think like, well, that's not actually measuring the ketones because 80% of your ketones are beta hydroxybutyrate. But what's cool about the acetone breath meter is that I can't influence that score with MCT oil or exogenous ketones, which mm. are all beta hydroxybutyrate, right? right yeah. So like it's giving me a very real analysis and it's funny because I've been struggling a bit to like get those numbers up and it's like, okay, I see, I see what's going on here. Cause if I do the blood prick, I'm going to, I'm going to see like 0.5 to one millimole and be like, I'm cool. I'm in nutritional ketosis, but that's all going to be exogenously coming in. Mm -hmm. So I think having something like that is, is really helping me dial in and increase the fat drop the carbs, drop the protein even, and see if I can get a good run for three months with this. Um, yeah, and then the longer I'm in ketosis, the the I'll deepen that intermittent fasting window from 16-8 to more like you know a 20-hour fasting window, four-hour feeding window, and see how I can operate from there. Nice. What are your favorite supplements? Let's see. Well, I work for Onnit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, 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 yeah. Disclaimer. Uh, um, you know, we have some really cool supplements coming out right now. I worked on our exogenous ketones that we have that are watermelon flavor. I think they're the best. Mm. I think they're the best. Plus, much higher concentration of sodium bound beta hydroxybutyrate. A lot of the products out there that taste good are really high magnesium concentration. So, like, that's an easy way to have disaster pants and shit yourself. Oh yeah, um, not a good look. So, <laughs> so good. Uh, I love I love Save our that for ayahuasca. Yeah, 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 exactly. Where it's at least like understood. Yeah, um, you know, Alpha Brain was one of the things that turned me on to on it. It's a plant based nootropic. One of my absolute favorites. You can take it at night and it'll increase your REM score. So if you wear something huh. like an Aura Ring or a Whoop watch, you'll actually see your REM score close to double from taking Alpha Brain at night. Wow. And that's dose dependent. I take I take I double the that. dose. Um, I have it with that with, I mean, my sleep cocktail is New Mood, which originally was called Roll On, Roll Off. It was to help with Molly hangovers. <laughs> I heard about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a great sleep supplement. You know, there's 5-HTP, L-tryptophan, valerian root, a lot of good stuff. I'll stack that with Alpha Brain and then uh, Key Minerals, which has magnesium in it and some melatonin. And that's usually like my sleep cocktail every night before bed. Sleep's the best hack. You know, like you think of like, well, <laughs> it doesn't matter what nootropic you take or, or how much caffeine you have. If you're not sleeping well, your brain's going to be mush. So I think hacking sleep is probably my top priority when it comes to performance and fat loss and everything in between. 
Um, and then actually getting my ass to bed on time. You know, like that's been the biggest change I've made in the last year is being very diligent. You know, 10 o'clock rolls around. If we're watching a show, we'll pick it up the next night. Yep. You know, like if we're, you know, with exception of the new Game of Thrones, like, but we'll, we'll, we'll turn that <laughs> on at 8.30, right? When Barry goes to sleep, so we're done at 9.30, we can chat about it and still be asleep by 10. So I think really planning our schedule around sleep has made a world of difference. Nice. Yeah. Who are some of your heroes in life? Paul Check, first dude who comes to mind. Um, he wrote the book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, which was the first book that got me into eating organic, grass-fed, free-range foods, the importance of that. Um, also has a number of questionnaires to help you dial in if you have a fungal issue like candida overgrowth, parasites, et cetera. Uh, and just really, you know, like he's he's been a wealth of knowledge in many avenues of my life. He's a close friend now. Uh, we've had the ability to do plant medicines together and grown very close, but he's a guy I continue to learn from on a regular basis and we chat often. Um, let's see, Dr. Dan Engel, I think is a phenomenal guy. He's been a guest on my show. Um, just a great dude. He spent a year in the Amazon working with ayahuasca as a curandero wow. and learning how to cultivate and create his own. Uh, he lives in Boulder, Colorado now. He's a licensed psychotherapist and psychiatrist. Um, he work. He's working with MAPS on uh, PTSD therapy with MDMA. You know, he's 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 really dialed in to mm. different protocols, including ketamine in the float tank, which is also an incredible way to float and an incredible reset in so, the float tank. In the float. Yeah. Oh, you've done so, it, but not in the float tank. Really, I have not combined them yet. Yeah. Really cool protocols. Yeah. yeah, there's a nasal spray you can have right before you go in for a float, and oh, it's wow. it's worn off by the time you get out. But I mean, it just. It drops you. You guys seen the movie Get Out? You know, he gets hypnotized. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just goes, and the yep. screen gets smaller and smaller as he's floating in space. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a scary movie, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's like. Yeah. So that's what you're recreating. Okay. No, okay. You know. no yeah, doubt. I mean, it just pulls you layers back. You know, like Eckhart Tolle talks about be the observer. Yep. You, mm -hmm. You're not your thoughts, you're not your mind, you're the awareness that witnesses that. Right. And I think that's one of the cool things about ketamine is that it it pulls you back far enough to where you can observe from the eagle eye view and see everything happening within yourself and be like, oh, shit, my mind is running rampant right now. Or that's where depression is coming from, this false belief that I, it'll never get better. And when you have that bird's eye view of everything, it it really puts things in perspective in yeah. a way that, that can't be done elsewhere. You know, you can get that through being an avid meditator and things like that. But that also takes work in itself. So yeah. I like these little cheats and, and hacks to, to get there quicker. For sure. Absolutely. Where can people go to find more out about you and follow you online? Yep. Yeah, so at Kingsboo, K-I-N-G-S-B-U on Twitter and Instagram. I'm, I'm off Facebook because I'm not that old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, my podcast just got a facelift. Same listeners, same still health and wellness. Um, it's Kyle Kingsbury podcast, no longer the Human Optimization Hour, starting May 1st. Nice. So, you know, if you, congrats if you're on that for that. Yeah, man. Yeah, we'll it's link good. To that it's too. good. Awesome, guys. We yeah. Have, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Thank you Dude, so much for doing this, man. Appreciate yeah. you. Awesome, you're the guys. man. Awesome.